we tend to live our life trying to keep certain things from happening, trying to keep things from getting worse, uh, trying to keep things from dying. There is a lot of, there is a whole industry, a whole philosophy, a whole uh, mindset built around trying to keep things uh, from falling apart. But today I want to present to you uh, a, a needfulness and a rejoicing that comes, that can be found or that comes with allowing things to degrade until they die. Uh, this is in the context of glory and specifically the kind of glory that comes when a seed is put into the ground. The word of God says that unless um, a corner of wheat falls down to the ground and, and dies, it remains alone. Amen. And this is the kind of glory that we're talking about. This is the kind of fruitfulness and the kind of life uh, that we are about to talk about now under the context of or under the headline of uh, allowing things to die. Right. Uh, uh, the word of God also says that creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Um, and I want to say that these sons of God are born in this way. The sons of God, because they are not the sons of God from the beginning, you know, they start off being sons of this world. They start off being uh, sons of even sometimes the devil, sons of, of the world, sons of the earth. Now because of that, they have to be born again. They have to be born again and born of God. Uh, and I want to say that this is a process and an experience that it is going to have to be experienced by everybody who is going to become a son of God. When we're talking about sons of God, we are talking about the ultimate, uh, the ultimate level of relationship we can have with God because God speaks of servants, he speaks of children, um, he speaks of ministering angels, right? But then we have sons of God. Now these sons of God are after the order of uh, Jesus Christ, who is our firstborn. And we have to understand that we are going, as sons of God in the making, we are going to have to follow in his footsteps. Uh, we see that he had to come as a man right because the children are men right and then when he came as a man his body was sown into the ground as a seed and what was born out of that was a son was the son of god after whom now we were going to be fashioned uh that if we believe in him that if we if we do what he says that if we follow him then we are going to be made in his image and we are going to become sons of God. And at the onset, when God chooses us to, or targets us to become sons, he instigates uh, circumstances and things in our lives, and even people to uh, begin to bring about this death I'm talking about. Um, and this death is to our body and to our ego. That inner man, that uh, hidden, you that you think you are or that you project to people or that people think you are uh, that is not necessarily who you are uh, we understand that god does not never has to put on uh, a, an, an, an expression for him to uh, portray himself he just is who he is and whatever we see of him comes out of who he is right so he doesn't need to uh, present himself in a certain way or to say things a certain way for us to respect him in a certain way or in a certain manner. His authority and his power is real. It's real. It doesn't need to be manipulated or to be enforced. It is like fire. When, when fire burns, it doesn't have to, it is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't have to, uh, whether you know that fire burns or not, it is going to burn. Like what you see how little children interact with fire for the first time. 
in the, in the in the beginning they don't really know what this thing is but they come to respect it um, because it has that it has that intrinsic uh, power that does not respect anything else you know you have to respect it uh, and so I want to say that when God begins to instigate the to instigate these uh, circumstances and things uh, uh, things that we suffer things that we experience uh, these things come to because initially we perceive them as coming to destroy us as things that we have to uh, guard ourselves against or uh, to set us to set ourselves to fight uh, and to oppose or to resist but these things are coming to bring out a glory in us um, um, that is unlike anything that has been seen on the earth before. And that is why creation is groaning, to see the, the revealing of the sons of God. And we do not yet see sons of God on the earth because of the extremity of the process of bringing up the sons of God. Because we see it in our Lord Jesus Christ, the extremity of his walk, uh, for him to uh, ascend as Lord, for him to ascend as Savior, for him to ascend as as a Son of Man, the Son of God. Amen. And and because of the lack of this understanding, uh, we do not allow this uh, this process to begin, or we we uh, we suppress it uh, and we hinder it. We hinder the Holy Spirit. Uh, and at this point, then I want to say that. Just as you're going about your daily life, there are things that will come at you uh, that if you are able to discern them well, you will be able to recognize them as opportunities for this death. You know, there are encounters that we have in our daily life with men, with things, uh, even in our post personal lives, that if we don't sit to interrogate them, what is this thing really coming to do in me? Like with the, with the life of Job, uh, the suffering that he's, suffered was coming to do a particular work it didn't matter how how much he he would have fought it it wouldn't have mattered um, because god has had already determined that joe would go through what he went through because god needed to prove something and he needed to bring something out of that suffering so when we are able to discern the things to differentiate the things that we should resist and the things that we shouldn't then we are we're beginning to tap into this uh, death that I'm talking about, the process of this death. And uh, and uh, further to that, further to that, we are able to come to a place, right? When we we, we when we have grown this understanding, when our understanding have grown has grown, uh, and we're no longer children, you know, uh, perceiving. Uh, labor and work as something painful and unwanted. We're able to perceive the reward at the end of the labor. So when we become, when we start to mature, we start to see this suffering as something to rejoice over. <laughs> as something to rejoice over. Why? Because we are able to see what it is producing in us. The Word of God says that suffering produces perseverance, patience, character. And uh, at the end of all that, we find glory. That is where glory comes from. It comes from suffering, because the suffering produces a certain character, a certain image in us. If we allow it, if we suffer well, and uh, after that uh, development has, has, has happened, and we have uh, qualified, then God glorifies us. Because the word of God says that those he calls, um, um, he is able to he is able to qualify, he is able to justify, and eventually he is able to glorify. Um, so we come, we are actually able to come to a point where we are able to rejoice when bad things are happening to us. Now let me break that down a bit in detail. Uh, when you suffer in your, in your, in your, when you are suffering, when you are feeling pain, or when you are feeling angry, or your pride is is, is provoked. Now that is uh, the, that is uh, showing you your flesh, the flesh, the part of you uh, that is alive in the flesh. 
Now, when you have this understanding that the, the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God, when you understand that there is no glory, there is no glory in the flesh, that there is only death, then you rejoice when something comes that is looking like as though it's trying to kill that pride, that is trying to challenge that uh, thought that you have that is false. Um, uh, uh, and I want to say at this point that uh, when we allow when we allow our flesh to be put on on the altar uh, as a sacrifice, we we are dead to our flesh in a way that puts to death fear, the fear of death. It's like a it's like a circle that uh, when you die to your flesh, at the same time you. Uh, you rob death of its sting because the sting of death, the power of death is in the fear of death. Once you're no longer afraid of death, then death has no power over you. Uh, so when you're going about your days, when these things again begin to happen, the things that used to provoke you before uh, become as nothing, you know, because you are dead to your, to your body, to your flesh, to the ideas of who you are, uh, or, or your title or what you own you're dead to those things so when something comes that is trying to challenge that that is trying to put you down in that area you're not responding to that because you're dead in that area and that is what God wants his sons to be like he doesn't want his sons to have their authority and their power their substance, their value and their worth in things, in titles or in names we have said that the authority of God is real. It doesn't matter whether you respect him or not. It doesn't matter whether you know him or not, like a little child. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the word of God says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that real authority comes about when we are separated from things, when we are made holy, when we don't have to when we are not affirmed in our authority by things, created things or by titles, by the way people look at us, by the way they treat us, by the way they respond to us. You know, it doesn't matter what they call us because we are who we are in Christ and that power that we have in him is real, is real. And that is why God instigates, through the Holy Spirit, instigates this process to put our ego to death. Because as long as that ego is alive, as long as that ego is alive, you cannot step into that real power that I'm talking about. Uh, you are a slave, a slave to what people say about you. You are a slave to what uh, the things that are being said out in the world. You know, you are bound to those things. You are not set free to be who you are in Christ. And so you see how this death is not something to run away from. When you are suffering in your flesh, in your body, you are lacking certain things that you ordinarily shouldn't lack. Like somebody might say, somebody in your shoes uh, or somebody with your background should not lack certain things, you know, should have certain things, should look a certain way, you know. So when we are being put to death in those areas, you know, we are being brought to a place where um, our external presentation and expression, in a way, in the eyes of men, contradicts who we say we are or who we are. You know, like in picture a king, a king who is walking on foot. And I know what the Bible says about that, right? But I don't want to go into that. It's going to be too complex. Now, picture a king who walks on foot. But remember your king when he came, the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. He was not riding horses. He was not living in palaces. But he was still as much a son of God uh, as he is right now seated at the right hand side of the Father. There is nothing that he didn't have or had in that time that augmented him, that increased his reality as Lord or as a son of God. Nothing physical he had, nothing, there is no title, he didn't have titles, except when they were calling him rabbi or teacher, 
but that was functional because of his function. So he, there was nothing that uh, uh, Jesus Christ had <laughs> that could have told you, that could have directed you to the, his other reality of being a Lord or a Son of God. He didn't look like it according to the eyes of men, but he was in every right uh, and in every way he was a Son of God. You know, and we could see the evidence in, in the things that he was able to do and in the authority, I mean in the uh, respect um, and the following that he was able to command even without horses and armies. You know, he left all that in heaven and came as a man, but he, he came as a man only outwardly. Inwardly he was divine, he was in every way God. It was God in flesh. It was God in in uh, God made flesh uh, living among us. Um, and so I want to tell you that this death, this threat, uh, the shame and the, and the embarrassments of the world, the way that the world perceives embarrassment and shame, those are not things to fear when you are walking or when you're on your way to become a son of God, when you are a son of God or when you understand what a, a son of God is, those are not things to fear. Those are not things to cover up from or hide from, right? Because we are elevated, we are elevated in our spirit, not in our body. Our body, it is neither here nor there. You know, you can have all the titles you, you men will give you, you can have all those bells and whistles, you know, you have the car to go with it, you have the big car to go with it, the big house to go with it, and the title to go with it. But inside there is no substance. There is no real authority to put you in that position where you have, that you have occupied. So we welcome it. We welcome this suffering. We welcome this death that God is, is, is bringing our way and we perceive it as being done in love because now we have understanding, now we have knowledge, we are no longer children, right? So we stop complaining, we stop running, we stop hiding, we stop pointing fingers, we even go now further into rejoicing, <laughs> into peace, into rest, um, because we know, we know what the glory that is being revealed in us when we are suffering in this way. Amen.